So we're here to talk about Skinamarink, which is uh, mm. 2020 is when it originally came out and it was like leaked online and it developed this kind of cult oh, fandom. I didn't realize that. But it's listed as 2022, but it's just now in theaters. Okay. So this is written and directed by a guy named Kyle Edward Ball. And it's uh, about an hour and 40 minutes. This is the latest uh, viral sensation in indie horror. And you guys know we love horror. And even more than that, we love indie horror. Mm -hmm. And this one, even compared to something like Terrifier 2 that we got all excited about last year, this one is truly indie. An incredibly small budget, one location, very shoestring, uh, piss and vinegar, making Mm -hmm. the most of what he had. Mm -hmm. And it's much more experimental than something like Terrifier 2, possibly to its detriment. The context here is that the majority of our theater that Maggie and I were in saying this walked out halfway yes. through. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> and we struggled with it too the entire time. But after after I got out of the movie and we were talking about it on the way home, I realized I needed to just talk this thing out. Mm-hmm. And then I remembered that we had this. Oh, right. <laughs> had this podcast. That's for exactly that purpose. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> talking out art. So yeah. additional context. I had never have and never will walk out of a movie. And no. I've enjoyed 99% of the movies I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I've probably disliked three movies ever. There's always something I can get out of it and enjoy. Like there's always going to be some part of the experience that you can value. Right. And I I love almost nothing more than the act of going to the movies. Right. Uh I love the the smell and the ritual Mm -hmm. and the seats and And all of it. I love it. Yes. So I'm always I'm always predisposed. Mm-hmm. to like things mm-hmm. as as you know pissy in particular as i can be on a show like this <laughs> i really like going to the movies yeah. and i I've, I've maybe disliked three movies ever yeah uh one of them was a horror movie from last year that we didn't talk about <laughs> you were so but upset about doing that some one. this one is so divisive and polarizing like doing some quick digging online to see if see what other people thought of this being mm-hmm. sort of an indie viral sensation that meant mm-hmm. there's a lot of chatter so i wanted to see what that was like there are exclusively one star and five star reviews for Skinamarink. Yeah. Nothing in between. I completely Nothing. believe that. Yeah. It is maybe the most divisive, challenging. Some have called it inaccessible. Some have <laughs> called it incomprehensible. <laughs> horror movie I've ever seen. Yeah. So we have sort of a structure to this uh, talk of me trying to make sense of this thing. And okay. I cobbled together the thoughts Maggie and I both shared in the car ride home and mm-hmm. gave it some structure. So we're going to talk about the good, then we're going to loosely walk through the movie and then talk about the stuff that yeah. I struggled with. So maybe we can say at the top right here, the good stuff that won't be spoiler territory, but then we're going to get into spoilers. Right. So and if you haven't seen it. The other thing is know. it's difficult to spoil this movie. Because yeah, because like two things happen. I read synopses online, and I disagree with some of it. Yeah, because there's not there's not a plot that happens. Right. There are things you could interpret a certain way, but it really doesn't have a traditional story. No. Right. So in that way, it is immune to spoilers. Even if I tell sure. you what I think happened, you will be bewildered for the majority of this experience. Totally. Yeah. So I, yeah, I think that's totally fair. This isn't one of those movies where if, if you are you know, hear about a plot twist, right. it's going to ruin a movie for you. Like, you can listen to our whole discussion and then go watch the movie and it, it not be what you expect no, at all. No, it won't. So. It won't change anything. So yeah. as much as as much as I had difficulties with this thing, I, I really admire that this movie, Skinamarink, is mm-hmm. a unique artistic experience unlike anything I have ever had in a theater. Absolutely. Unlike anything I've ever gotten from a book or a comic or a TV show. Yeah. In any medium. Yeah. I mean, maybe looking at an abstract painting is closest say, to this that's, experience. That's the closest thing it is for me, especially just what you were saying just now. It mm-hmm. feels so much like watching or, or looking at an abstract, like completely abstract painting mm-hmm. or watching a really experimental like video art, um, right, like, like right. in a video gallery um, or performance art that makes absolute, that is incredibly obscure and makes no sense. And I don't mean that as a judgment, like a value judgment, just that's, that's what it felt like. I never experienced a movie like this. Right. And we've been talking about this idea lately of creative limitations Mm -hmm. and more specifically self-imposed creative limitations. Mm -hmm. And as much as, yes, this had a a small budget, there are also a lot of choices and restrictions made by Kyle Edward Ball that are making this a challenging work of art. Mm -hmm. And here are a few of those just Mm -hmm. to walk through it. Very minimal use of actors and almost no shots of anyone's faces. Yeah. Which means that you can't identify with characters the normal way. You mm-hmm. can't develop characters the normal way. Mm-hmm. And but instead of that, you have to, you, there's some unusual fragmented characterization via 
partial shots. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, the kids' pajamas. You yeah. never see their faces, no. but you'll see like the legs of their pajamas. Mm -hmm. You'll see if one of them's barefoot walking through the house, mm -hmm. which highlights their voices yeah. as being essential to their performance. It's the only kind of full part of their character that you get. Right. Which ties nicely with the occasional POV shots where the camera seems to be following them looking through a room or walking through a room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there there are there are some really good unsettling camera movements yeah. that i noticed in the movie like mm -hmm. panning through a room like a reluctant participant totally yeah. like if you know something's on the other side of the room but you don't really want to look at it that mm -hmm. kind of slow reluctant thing yeah that was very effective yeah there was a lot of that it was good so the weird approach to characterization and actors and faces it does pay off in moments mm -hmm. where it's really intriguing and fresh mm -hmm. and I'm trying to keep this this part positive. Mm. There's also this wildly snowy VHS filter on every second of the movie. Yes. Heavy, heavy film grain popping mm -hmm. the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it wasn't filmed on one of those, <laughs> but it, it's layered on top of it so heavily that it, it blows out and blurs out parts of the movie. Yes. Which makes it more mysterious and gives you more to kind of search through mm -hmm. to find plot, story, clues, a monster, that kind yeah. of stuff. Mm -hmm. But most of the movie is corner shots. And this is another yeah. self-imposed creative limitation that I've never seen before. 90% of this movie is shots of the corner of a room being a ceiling or the floor. Mm -hmm. You see corners, you see chairs, chair legs, Legos on the floor, and blown out shots of an old TV playing black and white cartoons. Mm -hmm. That's the entire movie. <laughs> right. And like, that's not as exaggerating. That's literally the no, movie. No, 90% of the movie <laughs> is shots of a ceiling, the floor, and the corners of these couple rooms. That's true. I really hadn't thought about how many corner shots that are right. there, but they're, that's totally it. Yeah. And th there's a ballsy simplicity to that, mm -hmm. which I, I think is maybe the thing I most admire here. Mm. Because the skin of rink requires a level of patience and immersion that is utterly antithetical to our entire media landscape. Totally. Especially an era of TikTok yeah. and YouTube shorts yeah, and short Instagram form reels. content, scrolling. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Explosive, grabbing your attention, no attention span, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. For this to come out in this time mm -hmm. is pretty incredible. Yeah. For it to get made and then distributed, all of that, all of these steps along the line that seem tailor made to reject something in this style mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing that we could go see this at a theater absolutely yeah and it's going for something very specific and you can question its success but i love what it's going for mm. this ethereal mounting dread mm -hmm. trying to stick within this strict domestic setting and develop an otherworldly presence mm. that you barely see or have defined or discussed, but you have that sense and presence or essence or vibe or feeling. It's developing all of that with no money, with mm -hmm. shots of corners of a room. Mm -hmm. So you could very easily call that boring, but I think it's going for something incredibly real. Mm -hmm. And in that pursuit, it reminds me of something I love, like the first Paranormal Activity. Right. Or mm -hmm. The Strangers, mm -hmm. which we covered a couple months ago. Yeah. Well, those films dealt very specifically with the corruption of home, mm -hmm. the perversion of the everyday. Mm -hmm. And I have to respect this movie's unflinching demand for an audience's patience and attention. Yeah. And maybe my main complaint is that I wish it did more with mm -hmm. my rapt attention. I know. For I, an hour and 40 I, minutes. I didn't feel, I don't know if I like how this sounds, but I didn't feel like I was, like m my attention was rewarded, you know? Like I, it wasn't, it didn't feel quite worth it for me. I wasn't, because I, I love when a creator trusts its audience mm -hmm. and it <laughs> trusts their <laughs> audience <laughs> and then rewards them and, and things pay off. Right. I didn't feel like it quite paid off. Right. There were a couple of really interesting, really mm -hmm. intriguing moments, but I, I, I left wanting so much more out of it. Right. Right. Um, and that, I think that's the difficulty that I had. I think that maybe as we walk through the movie a little bit in the structure, it helps to think of this movie in thirds. Mm. And the first third is what I really struggled with. I think it has a very rough opening where I only understood the rules, uh -huh. the setting of the movie, 
probably halfway through during yeah. that second third. Yeah. At the beginning, and I know you don't have to have these things, but yeah. I still want to sort of state my experience with this work. Mm. There's no hook or premise for a while. Mm-hmm. I felt lost. I, I felt bored. Yeah. And then a while later, maybe in the middle of the movie, it kind of clicked. And then I mm-hmm. felt like I had some sort of bearing here. I knew in the first third that there were two kids and some sort of bad entity or monster in the house. Yeah. I knew that the parents weren't home, but the dad was. And then you saw a shot of the mom, but they were saying the parents weren't home. Yeah. And then there were shots of elements of the house appearing and disappearing. Mm-hmm. Like the toilet and a window. Yeah. But uh-huh. that's that's as much as you have to work with. And even that, you got to work to cobble yes. those details together. Yes. And there wasn't this, like, where is Waldo sense of involvement with the footage? To go back to a, a comparison of Paranormal Activity, mm. that movie is a lot of static shots of a room. Yes. But there's this element of they're filming, they know something's going to try to, you know, screw with them while they're asleep. Mm-hmm. So you're looking through the room for, uh, is the drawer going to open? Is the door going to open? Are the sheets going to rustle? Right. And every night that you see footage from, something like that does happen. Right. And you're also, in in that, in Paranormal Activity, you are looking at the footage that they are also looking at. Right, right, right. And so you're sort of on this journey with those characters. And at the beginning of the movie, you have the establishing moments where we understand who these two people are, what their relationship is with each other, what their problem is, and what they're trying to work out. And so you are immediately on board Mm -hmm. and like... Uh, in support of these characters and you want them to succeed versus here the only thing that's tying me to wanting things to go well is that they're children (laughs) right (laughs) you know which is like inherently like yeah i hope they're okay Mm -hmm. but i'm not i don't feel tethered to them at all but aside from that there are long stretches of characters just sort of waiting or idling yeah where they're not trying to piece together a mystery Mm -hmm. they might be vaguely scared or Mm -hmm. uneasy and i saw a lot of people online who loved this movie Mm. say that it evoked the feeling of childhood of not really knowing what was going on Mm. and only processing or understanding fragments of reality that's totally fair Mm -hmm. but also that it conjured up this nightmare feeling this Mm. surreal feeling of like sleep sleepwalking through your house and yes being in a like if you if you walked through your yard if you just walked outside and walked through the yard of your childhood house Mm -hmm. in the daytime that Uh would be fine yeah but if you did that same thing with no lights on at night it would be creepy it would it would be horrible (laughs) regardless of how much you trusted your neighborhood and your neighbors and what it would just be eerie but yeah it would be very strange and i've heard a lot of people say that this film conjured that same eeriness in them and that those longer atmospheric stretches of time were developing that atmosphere yeah and i agree that that's a relatable feeling Mm -hmm. and that that's a universal that is an admirable and tricky thing to shoot for Mm -hmm. but i think it stalls out on screen when I, it's extended this long. I agree too. I was going to say, I, I really like, like continuing on that. I really appreciated to an extent the cuts away to watching the cartoons because yes. that's what you do when you're a kid. You're If there's something scary going on, you're not really sure what's happening. I, I mean, I don't know about other people, but when I was a child, my instinct was not to go solve the problem. It was to watch TV and hope it goes away. Right, right. (laughs) Like, I'm not really sure what to do. The TV's on. I'm here with my, you know, with my sibling. I'm just going to watch this while still feeling vaguely afraid, Mm -hmm. but hoping this will like tune out the scary thoughts, the scary dreams, and it'll just go away. And those like moments of us also watching the cartoons Mm. also felt like a bit of a reprieve of like, okay, okay, whew, we're not looking at a creepy, scary, you know, mom sitting up in the dark anymore. We're just watching a cartoon now. And that felt like a bit of, like, relief right. while still being worried about what's going to happen next and that's still in the back of your mind. And I liked that to an extent, but I do think it there was too much of all of it. Like, it, it, I mean, which I guess counters what I said earlier where I said I didn't feel like I got enough. It There was too much of the anticipation and the buildup and not enough of the... Um, satisfaction after. I mean, simultaneously, a movie can be too long and not explain enough. 
Yes. Or right. uh, we watched a movie, Dog Tooth, the other day uh-huh. from the director who did uh, The Favorite and The Lobster yeah. and uh, Killing of a Sacred Deer, uh-huh. uh, Yorgos Lanthimos. Yes. Uh-huh. And we love his movies. And yeah. this one is earlier and mm-hmm. much more experimental than those. Yeah. And it was weird and wacky and hard to <laughs> get a grip on. Yeah. But then it really, really got going. It did. Towards the end. Yeah. And then it just ended. Yes. It needed like eight more minutes it yeah it felt like you were missing the second half of the third act yes it was so frustrating because i was like because i had i had gotten like i was reluctant at first mm. but i knew it was gonna get weird and i was and then it started ramping up and i was okay i'm on board this is gonna be really interesting i'm so excited and then it just ended and it was incredibly disappointing this right. movie wasn't quite like that because it never even got to that ramping up point you know? They're both pretty fascinating experiences, but yes. from a movie like Dogtooth, I get the idea of it. Uh, it's not long enough. Uh-huh. And from this one, I get the feeling that it's too, too long, long, but also it, that it spends its time in the wrong places. Like, yes, that I think m- the time is just not used in the right way. The middle third worked for me. And yes. that was, I think that's what you just sort of began the discussion about of the cartoons. Mm-hmm. Because if I tried... I don't know if I could spoil this movie, but I guess this is the closest I can get. All right, we'll do our best. <laughs> you, you're seeing these old public domain black and white uh, cartoons. Uh-huh. And in the cartoons, there's a bunny and the bunny like raises its hand and kind of collapses them down, like almost like a big clap. Mm-hmm. And the bunny disappears. Yeah, he like makes himself disappear. Yeah. And that's a bit of the cartoon, like that starts to loop. Uh-huh. The, the TV the kind of freezes up and loops uh-huh. that sequence yep. over and over. And that's a bit of the cartoon connecting or explaining the monster. That's a bit of you getting the rules. Uh-huh. And th- I loved that. That was yes. the highlight of the movie for me, the connective tissue, a little bit of a payoff. Uh-huh. Instead of just getting sort of vaguely interesting imagery, right. which was nice, uh-huh. but it felt thin after a while. Yes. That's where it really worked for me. Right. And but it, I, it took its time, but it was still like, it, it was worth it because right. you were like, oh, I understand this rule about this creature. How interesting. Because you'd seen things before disappear. Yeah, but you didn't know why or how. And then you see it in the cartoon and it, and it starts to click. So that makes sense in the middle third, but you don't get that in the first or the third thirds. Right. <laughs> so you just get a rule halfway through the movie, uh huh. but there's no buildup and it doesn't really go anywhere. That's right. It doesn't go anywhere. So yeah. you, like, you also get more dialogue in this middle third that worked for me between the boy who we're following for most of the movie uh-huh. and the monster. You yes. find out a little bit what happened to the girl, the daughter. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You find out a little more about the parent's absence and return. Mm-hmm. And then there's the moment where the kid tries to call 911. Mm-hmm. And then you get the reveal shot of this toy phone. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the implication is that no help is coming and the, right. the monster is sort of faking it Yes, for mm-hmm. the kid. Mm-hmm. And again, that was satisfying, interesting, felt new. I was, I really liked that. It was that. creepy. It was unsettling. It yeah. had that payoff of tying the childlike, whether it's the cartoon or the toys, mm-hmm. to this surreal monster world. Right. I really liked that. Mm-hmm. But then everything slides out of focus again in the last third of the movie where yes. everything gets way more opaque than it even has been up until this point. It gets right. abstract and obscure, reversing the apparent trend of the film starting to clarify its narrative mm-hmm. and return a little bit to normality. Like It felt like the movie was just coming into focus, slowly giving us the tools of the story. Even the shots were stabilizing. We were getting less of just five-minute shots of corners. Mm-hmm. It was more... Uh, normal sort of mid-range, even keel shots of the playroom. Yes. Seeing doors, seeing the TV centered, seeing the chair, seeing characters more clearly. There was more plot that mm-hmm. was that was developing in now that we were really immersed in this, this house, in this world. Mm-hmm. We got a conversation that revealed something. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just the kids whispering in kind of mutual fear right. and confusion. Right. We were getting something. That 911 conversation, uh-huh. we're getting something out of that that develops a plot. Right. But instead, we just go back to the well-composed, vaguely <laughs> cool imagery, and the film yeah. fuzzes out. We get this slow zoom out of the playroom, but mm-hmm. all the Legos are gathered up near the TV. Mm-hmm. We see a blurry female face that might be the mom, but... Might not be, and we don't really know what she's doing there, and it fades away, and apart from assuming that everyone died in the Monster One, there's no (laughs) real ending or resolution to the plot threads we do have a grip on. Right. Like, I could guess 
I could theorize. Mm-hmm. If I wanted to, I could have spent two hours and made a theory <laughs> about this movie. I can get something out of anything. Sure. I can write a paper. I, I, <laughs> I, I did grad school. <laughs> I can dissect this thing and get stuff out of it. But uh-huh. I wasn't left wanting to. Well, exactly. I was going to say, I didn't feel com- compelled to do that because I'm all for an ambiguous ending. I'm all right. for like trying to piece together and figure it out. But I want to want to do that. And I didn't leave this movie wanting to piece it together. I just left it feeling like, what do I do with that? Like the conversation with one of the parents, if that was the mother at the end. Yeah. That could have been some explanation. That could have right. been some some sort of key to the previous weirdness mm-hmm. that helped us understand it in a different light. Or if we got like an establishing scene at the beginning that like something. has a tie to something that happens at the end. Like something. But... The, the fact that we started to get a little, I don't know, and then the lights <laughs> went up, like the remaining people who didn't walk out, because uh-huh. most of the people walked out, yeah. the couple people who were left behind us, they were either pissed or just mm-hmm. started laughing. Yeah, because they didn't know what to do with it. They're like, oh, because it wasn't even like the credits didn't even roll. Like the movie, like it like fades out and, and it says like the end and then literally that's it and the lights come up. Because, it's not like, it's not like right. a normal movie where the credits roll and there's music and then people slowly get up. They like, did all those at the beginning. Yeah, right. exactly. It's all at the beginning. So it literally just ended. So uh, let's go through some difficulties. Yeah. Uh, and these aren't things we've already mentioned. These are sort of more broad strokes. One is the inconsistent subtitles. Mm-hmm. Very frustrating when... The only guide you have through this movie is the occasional scrap of dialogue that yes. you have to mull over and yeah, interpret. That's all you have, yeah. About half of it was subtitled. Mm-hmm. Which is really helpful because it's, it's very hard to understand. It's a muffled, you know, four year old saying something vague, and some yeah. of that was subtitled almost in recognition of it being difficult to understand. Yes, or it's like it's coming from another room, it's mm-hmm. so subtitled, but not every line was subtitled. About half of it wasn't. And. <clears throat> of that half, I probably only understood a third of it. Right. And so there was like a whole chunk of the film of the movie's story that I just didn't get because right. I couldn't understand it. And I know that maybe that's intentional, but I'm thinking if you're going to subtitle it, subtitle it. Like either do or don't. <laughs> and, and I found that yeah. really frustrating. On the ride home, we were trying to sort of collaborate and work through this thing. And that lack of connective tissue or mm-hmm. payoff of the imagery that is established for an hour and 40 minutes, something like the Legos. Mm -hmm. So many of the things you stare at for minutes at a time doesn't really go anywhere or pull together. Like it's motifs that don't really represent anything, that don't pay off, that don't change in context or Uh meaning. Uh And the other thing is that a few of the overtly scary moments, meaning more than just creepy, blue lit, uh, you know, nighttime (laughs) atmosphere, the couple scary shots you do get, Mm -hmm. the girl's face Mm -hmm. when it's all messed up, a hand appearing around a door, those like... uh, I don't know, three horror yeah. moments that you get. There's like some blood splattering on, right. the, on the floor. Yeah. They're jarringly undercut with loud jump scare sound effects uh-huh. that are very uncharacteristic because early on in the movie, when you see those first few shots of household things disappearing, uh-huh. you establish this like woo, 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 woo sound effect uh-huh. for, okay, there's weird magic monster stuff yeah, happening. Right. But he, he doesn't use those for those horror shots. He uses mm-hmm. this like kind of 2010 Conjuring Universe jump scare yes. pound it, on the piano or whatever. And I didn't like that because it, it just felt like he was insecure in his own jump scares. It was very jarring. Like he wasn't trusting his movie. I mean, I know that sound I mean, a sound is incredibly important in film, especially in horror. But he's like, you're right. He's established this like auditory language for his for his movie it's almost a silent film right and then to add that in i don't think it suits it at all and it doesn't even feel like a oh it's intentionally different like it just felt like i'm not confident that this is scary enough so let me add a scary sound to it because if you google skinamarink and you look at google images Uh you get all of the shots that we're talking about right now Mm. the openly scary shots of something that's recognizable and horror Yeah. Which is 1% of the movie. Yeah. And those moments, which are the things you remember and the takeaways, I wish they weren't frustrating in the moment. Of like, why did you just undercut that? Yeah, uh-huh. Because those moments 
should have been silent. Right, right. I mean, the moment that sticks with me the most is not any of those shots. Mm-hmm. It's, you don't see anything. It's, um, I guess, spoilers, but it's when the monster tells the kid to put the knife in his eye. That, right, right. That really right. unsettled me, mm-hmm. and I was not expecting it, and the way he said it was really scary, and the fact that we didn't see it, I was imagining it, and it wasn't paired with a jump scare sound. It that was, was just, fantastic. It was right. just like done over the, you know, the snow, like mm-hmm. white noise of the TV with like the cartoon in the background. That was incredibly unsettling, right. and I loved that, but the, the other scary moments didn't didn't trust themselves mm-hmm. enough to do it in that way. There were a handful of excellent moments and mm-hmm. excellent images, mm-hmm. but the difficulties through the execution and through just the experience of watching this, like one of my main difficulties was that it felt like once the movie settled in, we were largely following the little boy. Yeah. But the beginning of the movie, it felt like we were following the dad more. Yeah. And then I don't really know what happened to the dad. Yes. But like, not like in a what happened to the dad, just more in like a wait, what? Right. Because you get some <laughs> of those POV shots, but you don't know if it's the monster or the kid or the dad. And yes, sometimes that's interesting to yes. try to figure that out. But it but was too much. <laughs> you stack so many mysteries that you, you kind of get unmoored yes, from and, the narrative. And then you start not caring be because you're so unmoored because you're not tied to anybody again beyond i hope that people don't die and that right. you know, like it's but you're not tied to them as characters as people it's just i vaguely hope nothing bad happens and you're not on their team because right. they're just existing or sitting like right. it's hard to get invested in all of these mysteries and unravel all of this imagery when none of the characters are doing that right mm-hmm. like I, sp- I felt like i was spending most of my time trying to figure out who we're following Mm -hmm. and what they're saying yeah and that means that i couldn't try to piece together the the plot that was there right because i wasn't even there because i was still trying to figure out just i was trying to get my bearings Mm -hmm. yeah so like as much as if you i don't even know if there are trailers for this thing but (laughs) in the first 10 minutes you will understand why this thing is divisive yeah the creative limitations that way the whole time (laughs) right like it's not like one of those movies was like oh just get past the first 10 minutes and then it's great (laughs) it's the same way the whole way through oh yeah and you and you might love that or you might not but that's what it is the creative limitations of this movie are the immediate challenges that will turn off most people yeah but i think the runtime the structural plot issues we talked about, those held me back way more than the shots of the corners for an hour and a half. Again, it wasn't the concept I didn't like. Mm -hmm. I loved the concept. I was so intrigued by it. I was like, this is really interesting. I love how much he's going for it. I like how weird this is. I, I, I like the idea of not fully understanding what's going on, but you're right. Like the, in terms of those executional Uh artistic choices, I think that kind of, Uh, It just made it not quite work for me. And uh, even though I was frustrated through a lot of this, Uh or I don't know, you reach this weird, like, tranquil, I don't know, I think I'm bored, I'm frustrated, I feel behind, I feel lost, I feel like I'm losing (laughs) it. I don't know, like, the movie did not work for me, but I'm very glad I saw it. I'm glad I got to see something like this in a theater Mm -hmm. and be challenged like this. I'm very impressed that this guy got this movie made and did all pretty much the whole thing himself. Yeah. I'm excited to see what he does next. Totally. Yeah. And like we don't we don't talk about art in a way of ending it with a, a letter score that we recommend no. it. But I like that I had this experience mm-hmm. even though it was difficult. Yeah. Yeah, I I really think that there's so much that I did like about this. I think I said this in the car on the way home. I think this would have been a great 30-minute short film. Like I think that would have worked really really well. I think when you're doing like short form, like like either short stories or short film, you can be a lot more ambiguous um, because you you only have to hold on to the audiences like uh, you only have to keep them on board for mm. a short amount of time. And so if you leave it ambiguous, then you're like, well, of course I don't get the full story. That was just a small chunk. And so you don't leave feeling dissatisfied the way that we did in a full length feature film right. where it, it, it just it, I didn't think it worked. So I think if this had been a short 30 minute film, it would have been awesome. But you know, who's where do short films go? They go nowhere except to festivals, and then they die. So I guess I understand. But plenty of movies don't make it out of festivals. But yeah, <laughs> well, right, yeah. So, so you know, really interesting idea. <laughs> yes, yeah, totally. Really interesting. Like again, a lot of people do really like this. Yeah, um, and I'm not bagging on it. No, but yeah. it's something I wanted to talk through and work through because it it is such a challenge. So, mm-hmm. and I like it as like a response to the found footage. 
um, sure. you know, uh, hysteria of the early 2000s as a response to paranormal activity. like As a response to a jump scare every five seconds. Yes, And a right. meta joke about horror movies nowadays. Right, and as a response to the TikTok um, mm-hmm. attention span era. Like, I, I think that's really fascinating. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's frustrating that it didn't work for me the way I wanted it right. to, but it was pretty... It was pretty remarkable yeah. that this was in. It wasn't even like in like an old little it indie was an theater. AMC. It was in an AMC, like at a normal time. Yeah. So if you're able to see this movie, it's go earnest check it out. and passionate and weird and not like anything you've ever seen. It <laughs> is not trying to satisfy you. It is not trying to answer your questions. Yeah. But yeah, weird. Yeah. Very, weird, interesting experience. So totally. yeah, we want to talk about it. We practice what we preach. We said this would work better as a half hour thing. So. We're turning out a little half hour episode. Oh, so. look at that. <laughs> this is 37 <laughs> minutes of us talking out skin and rink and uh, me being uh, almost murdered by a lion. Yep, almost. So we will be back uh, <laughs> for our normal Friday episode uh-huh. for, uh, what are we talking Witcher. about? Witcher. Witcher, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that is uh, the Tower of Swallows. We'll be diving into the next chapter of that, which was a lot of fun. It was, yeah. And uh, yeah. We are Second Breakfast Pod on all of the uh, social media. Anywhere yep. you can look, we're there. You can email us, secondbreakfastpod at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought of this movie. Totally. Like, yeah. seriously, if you loved it, I would mm-hmm. love to know why. If you hated it, I would love to know why. Yeah. Um, do see it and share your thoughts, because it's it's interesting. It's, it's weird. It's weird. And uh, where do you mention the Substack? There's the Tarantino thing. There's mm-hmm. a bunch of other exclusive and some weird horror in there. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah, we'll see you on uh, Friday for more fantasy. All right. Cool. Toodaloo. Bye.